Prime Minister Sanchez, welcome back to Davos and uh, congratulations on your re-election. Um, I would like to start um, off by thanking you for your friendship and commitment. This is uh, your fifth time in Davos physically and then you even joined us when we had to do it virtually. So thank you very much uh, for that. And um, also I would like to underline that you just um, concluded a very successful and eventful presidency of the European Union, achieving some key milestones, such as an agreement of the electricity market, the Critical Raw Materials Act, and the Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, to mention a few. And of course, um, most important was the start of the accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova that took place under the Spanish presidency. Your government has also led a robust economic performance despite uh, global turbulence. Um, uh, that uh, is also a major achievement. So, Prime Minister, I invite you again to share with us your vision for Europe and for Spain and uh, your country's role in Europe and in the world. So, welcome. So thank you very much, Morgan. Thanks, uh, dear friends. Uh, so I, I will start with an exercise uh, stating, like, imagine for a moment that, that we are uh, in the year 2013, in the 60th edition of this forum. Imagine that, uh, that the world has failed to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the goals of the Paris Agreement. Imagine that the planet's temperature has risen for more, more than 1.5 degrees, causing the degradation of our ecosystems, uh, and uh, that our GDP has fallen by 15 points. Imagine that fake news and, and political polarization have uh, reduced the number of democracies that the advance of uh, digitalization and artificial intelligence, intelligence has not properly governed and has increased inequality and expelled millions of people from the labor market. Imagine this is a scenario and tell me, would it be good for your business? More importantly, would it be good for your children, for your grandchildren, for your friends, for your fellow citizens? Because the future I'm describing to you is not a, a dystopia. It is a possible future. A likely projection of the world we will end up having if we let ourselves be carried away by inertia or resignation. The stakes are high. 76 countries, more than half of uh, the world's population will hold elections this year and uh, crucial political decisions will have to be made regarding some of the main societal uh, dilemmas we face. So here I would like to refer to three of them that I consider particularly timely. The first concerns the very survival of the rules-based international order that has brought us so much prosperity since the end of the World War II. Spain is a full democracy. It is an open, modern, and tolerant country that defends the European project, but also the globalist dream that inspired the creation of the UN and the Bretton Woods institutions. That is why we are committed to economic openness, to international solidarity, and uh, to the multilateral system, a system that is uh, threatened by those who promote fragmentation, intimidation, or the use of force to impose their interest and will. It is happening in Ukraine, a country that is fighting for its freedom against Putin's authoritarianism, and uh, where millions of people have been displaced uh, from their homes. And let me be clear, we support Ukraine, and we welcome the recent announcement of Future Peace Summit that upholds the principles and values and dreams in the UN Charter. It is also happening in Syria, where 
and now, and now forgotten war has taken the lives of more than 300,000 souls, 4,000 last year alone. And it is happening in Gaza where 24,000 people have died in just 100 days and hundreds of thousands stand on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe. Elderly people, women, innocent children who have lost their homes, their jobs, their families. Of course, and now are on the verge of losing their homes and hope. We recognize Israel the legitimate right to defend itself against a vile and monstrous uh, terrorist attack. But we also demand the respect of international humanitarian law. That is why here today I would like to reiterate once again the need for an immediate ceasefire and for convening an international conference to implement a definitive solution to this long-lasting conflict. A solution that recognizes the existence of two states, Israel and Palestine, living in peace and security. I want to do so because this human drama must be stopped, because the current course of events uh, will not help either the Palestinian people nor the Israeli, but also because what, it, what is at stake is the security of the global supply chain. It is trade, prosperity, the stability of the entire Middle East, and the continuity of the multilateral order. Friends, the future, the future stability of the world is being decided in Ukraine and Gaza while we speak. So we cannot get this wrong as we got it wrong in other places. We must be coherent and uphold the same principles and values whatever and whenever there is a breach. We have to push for dialogue, for the rule of law, and for peace. The second global challenge I would like uh, to share with you is that we need to address the governance of artificial intelligence. Look, I am a firm believer of scientific progress. I'm sure that the AI and other cutting-edge technologies are the best, uh, the best option we have to overcome challenges such as aging, the environmental crisis, the spread of diseases, or, or low productivity. And that, if we use them well, they will allow us to reach unimagined levels of welfare. But I also believe that this opportunity should not make us ignore the threats. Polls reveal that a majority of citizens think AI will destroy their jobs, widen the gap between the rich and the poor, and worsen their standards of living. And we must listen to these fears. We must pay more attention to the concerns of our workers, our youth, our elders, and less attention, if I may, to the empty promises of some Silicon Valley gurus who are more interested in gaining followers or climbing the Forbes list than in the true progress of humanity. Our duty is to understand that people's concerns are not ignored, that the danger is real, and that we should give them an effective and coordinated, coordinated response. Today, more than ever, the world needs a global governance of digitalization, a governance that uh, defends the fundamental rights of citizens above the interests of states and corporations, a governance that tackles the cyber threats, deep fakes, toxic lies that circulate online and threaten our democracies and the very safety of our children. A governance that guarantees that AI systems do not uh, incorporate discriminatory biases of, or replicate all injustice, while it facilitates innovation and investments for the development of this technology. That is the purpose of the European AI regulation, recently approved under the Spanish presidency of the Council. And, and please, do not uh, take me for a, a ludic. Uh, uh, I'm a staunch defender of technolog technological progress. I am, not, uh, I am the president of the country that is determined to have a leading role in the current industrial revolution, a country that has launched a strategic plan with more than 
12.5 billion euros to foster semiconductor manufacturing in Spain, a country that leads the European rankings on the digitalization of the public sector and that has just launched one of the 10 most powerful supercomputers in the world. I firmly believe that digitalization will have good and necessary, that it will make life better for all of us. But I also believe that history teaches that this result will not come by itself. We will have to fight for it, and we are going to do it for the sake of our children and our planet. Those of us who learned to not uh, to believe in the invisible hand of the market cannot now profess blind faith in the invisible hand of artificial intelligence. Invisibility is usually sold to the devil, not good. I only trust the hands of flesh and bone. The hands or the ones that rise the shutter of the business every morning, the ones that hold the book at school, make dinner at night for their family, or cast a vote in the ballot box. I care. I care for those hands, real and visible. That is why I believe that the third major challenge ahead of, uh, of us is to ensure the prosperity of our citizens. The far right is growing. Autocratic regimes are proliferating in the West and other regions of the world. But the truth is that this terrible trend is only a symptom of deeper problems. One of them is the erosion of the middle and working classes. The same middle and working classes that uh, have uh, not always benefited from the economic transformations of the last few decades, that suffered during the financial crisis of 2008 and 2012, and that now are anguished about the future, uh, marked by uncertainty while they keep losing purchasing power. Life is expensive. It already was before Putin's war, and uh, the pandemic combined to unleash an inflationary crisis. Saving some money, buying a home, or simply going on vacation is becoming increasingly difficult for a growing part of the world's population. And that, that is a problem. A betrayal to those who build this system with their hard work and sacrifice, and to whom we owe everything, democracy, social justice, and freedom. So we must stop this erosion, and we must do so without turning our backs on our values, the environmental crisis or the needs of the poorer countries. In short, we must be bold and define a new paradigm of prosperity, a new economic and social orthodoxy that takes advantage of the knowledge and the new tools we have to couple economic growth with environmental sustainability and prosperity for all. I'm, I'm, fully, I'm fully aware that this is the goal pursued by many governments around the world of different ideologies. And I must tell you that this is ultimately the main project that my country, Spain, is undertaking. In recent years, we have shown that it is possible to create wealth and improve workers' conditions at the same time. We have increased the minimum wage by 54%. We have expanded labor rights. We have reduced temporary employment inequality and poverty. And we have created more than 2 million new jobs, many of them in high-value-added sectors, such as the tech industry. At the same time, we have grown above the Eurozone and the OECD average. We have been one of the fastest in Europe in bringing down inflation. We have attracted more FDI than ever before, and our companies have produced record profits. In short, we have shown that economic competitiveness and the people's prosperity are not incompatible. Furthermore, we have also shown that it is possible to strengthen the welfare state while underpinning its sustainability. The advance in gender equality is not a, only a matter of justice, but uh, that it has a positive impact on economic growth, that investing in science, innovation, and human capital will result in long-term productivity gains. We have lowered uh, 
taxes for the middle and working classes and raise them for the wealthy. We have cut the public deficit by half. We have expanded the support that the state provides to both citizens and companies. We have implemented an unprecedented policies, billions of euros to support workers and households, free public transportation, and a pioneering minimum vital income that already benefits more than two million vulnerable people in my country. We have promoted policies that we are, or we were told were impossible or reckless, and yet they have proven to be possible and beneficial. Today, Spaniards know that neoliberal policies do not work, that the option of cutting the size of the public sector and leaving citizens and small businesses on their own when prob problems arise makes no sense, and that when we collaborate and stand to together, we are stronger. My country has shown that it's, that it's possible to grow while fighting climate change. I say that in five years, we have cut our consumption of natural resources by 7%, reduced our emission by 10 points, and increased our renewable energy production by 34%. In 2023, Spain generated half of its electricity from the sun, wind, and water. Uh, we have been the first major EU economy to achieve this. And these environmental advances have not made us poorer, nor have they made us less competitive. Quite the contrary. They have allowed us to develop new industries, create thousands of new jobs, and, and uh, generate energy at very competitive prices. Today, my country, Spain, households and businesses pay 58% less for the electricity bill than in 2022. But uh, to further succeed, this new model of prosperity will need to increase the involvement of the private sector. Companies are essential for the growth and well-being of our country. They create employment, innovation, territorial cohesion, opportunities to make us better. But the creation does not occur in a vacuum. You, your companies, are a product of democracy, a product of a rules-based international order and of welfare state that sustain the middle and working classes, that guarantee peace and ensure adequate levels of human capital and prosperity. Without the, these pillars, your business models would collapse like a house of cards. And for that reason, I call upon you to get involved. Help us to rise the purchasing power of workers, to stop the climate emergency, to vindicate international rules, and to defend democracy and fight the involution represented by the reactionary wave, wave sweeping the world. In short, in short, help us to give people a better life. Do not buy the old neoliberal postulates that portray the state as a poorly extractive entity that's uh, that doesn't not, uh, does not sorry, generate value, or that claim that the only responsibility of companies is to increase the profits of their shareholders. These ideas have been proven wrong by science and by experience. You know it. You know that companies need governments to innovate and grow, and that if companies do not work together, if they do not align their interests with those of society as a whole, we will not be able to overcome the great challenges of our time. And this will have an impact for good on your businesses. So act accordingly, act responsibly, think in long term, do not allow yourselves to be dragged along by those radical media outlets and political parties that are obsessed with uh, projecting us as systemic rivals that profit from selling polarization. Do not fall into their trap. Let's cooperate. Let's collaborate. Let us uh, take advantage of the major challenges I mentioned earlier to build bridges, enhance synergies, and establish new forms of public-private cooperation and collaboration. 
the government of Spain is your ally. We have learned by our experience that there, there, there is a, a virtuous cycle between growth and redistribution of growth. That the best and the most resilient way of growing is by making sure that the benefits of growth reach the entire population, especially the most vulnerable. Spain is a paradise for those companies that want to prosper through innovation, talent clean, and cheap energy, institutional stability, and top-notch infrastructure. For those companies that want to get rich by generating real value and paying their fair share of taxes, we welcome these companies with open arms. So, dear friends, we are at the dawn of a crucial year, a year in which the future of the international order and of liberal societies will be shaped. Our citizens won't fail us, I'm sure. They will be up to the task, as they always are in the crucial moments. But it is important that governments and companies are too. We must work together to build a new prosperity, a new virtuous triangle formed by the private sector, the state and civil society that will allow us to guarantee economic prosperity and has enhanced sorry, well-being and equality and ensure environmental sustainability for all and all across the world. It won't be easy, but it will be worth the effort. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Prime Minister. Uh, as you said, uh, FDI inflow to Spain uh, is uh, very high, the highest uh, you have seen uh, in the past. Uh, economic growth uh, is higher than the euro uh, average and also inflation lower. Do you think that some of your colleagues uh, in Europe can uh, learn something from your policies and what policies do you think they should be inspired by? Thank you, thank you, Borg, for, for your question. I would say that we are living in a period that we need leaders that transform uh, uh, societies and not administrate societies. And so to keep that, is, that stability, uh, political stability, social stability, economic stability within our societies, but also uh, thinking broader uh, at the European level, we need to transform ourselves to, to earn uh, competitiveness, to understand that uh, climate change, digital transformations are uh, uh, big tools uh, for, the, for the good of our societies. And not to use some of the crises that we're facing, such as the war in Ukraine and the uh, uh, energy prices to uh, slow down or to put aside our uh, commitment uh, regarding the ecological transition of our economies. And uh, that, of course, uh, that idea of transformation means that, for instance, when we touch um, our experience uh, chairing the European Council uh, during the last semester, uh, and the reform that you mentioned before, the uh, electric reform, uh, you know, this has been <laughs> a real and very complex debate. And I think, you know, the companies I thank also the Commission and the Parliament by, because I think that we reach a very important agreement uh, for the good of, of our continent and, uh, and our competitiveness. Do you, Prime Minister, uh, think that sometimes we lack self-confidence uh, in Europe? Uh, you know, in 2012, um, international actors were saying that the euro was going to uh, be in really deep uh, problems, even challenged as a currency, still the second most important currency in the world. Then it was Greece that was going to go bust, and no, together with Spain, one of the fastest growing economies. You had one of the highest youth unemployments and unemployment rates, and uh, you are now in like a comeback uh, situation. And uh, we were going to also uh, be freezing the whole winter because of uh, making ourselves uh, independent of uh, Russian gas, um, is it a little bit, do we have to explain also more the political processes we have in Europe when there are 
democratic states that come together, of course there will be discussions. And then it usually ends up with something, but the media is writing so much about the process, so people think that maybe this is a mess, but this is democracy. This is democracy, it? and I, I, I completely agree with you. I think that the, the most wonderful experience that I have from this debate around the table of the European Council is to see prime ministers and head of states debating and trying to, to find a landing zone for the good of our societies. And this is democracy, we, and democracy needs, uh, or the, it has its uh, timing uh, to, to move for, for, uh, further. And I think that this is what we did, for instance, uh, during the pandemic, uh, during the, uh, you know, the, this very important agreement on the uh, next generation funds, and of course, uh, our common approach uh, uh, with regard to uh, the uh, conflict in, in Ukraine. So, you know, this is uh, the, the instruments that we have, and I think that this is the most important uh, strength that we as Europe uh, have. But maybe sometimes you think it's uh, of course is a little bit of tough, I, I, and uh, you also. And, and, and of course, you know, you, you, you were telling uh, uh, before, you know, in, in your remarks that, of course, we, we have this uh, uh, Spanish presidency. We open uh, the talks of negotiations with uh, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Western Balkans. Uh, there were some coffee hopefully. breaks there, weren't there? Uh, and, uh, and indeed, you know, uh, this enlargement will uh, table uh, the urgency and necessity to reform our institutions our, and our uh, uh, decision-making process, you know, passing from a, you know, a unanimity to a qualified majority. But these are, you know, like instruments, tools. Uh, the most important thing is the geopolitical shift that we are going to, to witness uh, in Europe in the coming years. And I think this is for good, and, uh, and uh, this will also stabilize, in my opinion, in the uh, short term and medium term, the situation in the uh, eastern uh, part of Europe. But in your speech, you also strongly underlined the importance of sticking uh, to core values, European values, UN Charter, democracy and all this. And uh, we're seeing uh, currently a polarization uh, in, in the US. Uh, there is fundamental polarization but aren't we seeing the same happening in the EU today? And um, ho are you afraid that this polarization will just escalate? Or do you see possibilities for some convergence uh, moving forward? Uh, you were able to push through, for example, the accession of Ukraine and, and Moldova. That was not expected. But how do you see that? How, how, how is it possible uh, to get more convergence and not end up in disagreeing on everything. So you have like three dimensions uh, uh, of the debate and three institutions in the European Union framework. The first one is uh, the European Council, and I, I see, you know, a common sense that we need to move further, even, even if, I mean, it doesn't matter if you belong to a right-wing political family or a, a left-wing political family. I mean, I think that there's a landing zone a common sense uh, to move forward in some uh, issues such as this uh, internal reform that we need to face uh, in order to be effective in, in, in the enlargement process. Then you have the Commission, and for that I believe that after the European elections what we need is to have a, 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 an agreement uh, among the major political families, Social Democrats, uh, the Popular Party, and also Liberals. And finally we have the European Parliament. And uh, for that, I think it's crucial, it will be instrumental that our citizens, uh, you know, they uh, strength, I would say, the traditional families and not the far right in order to, to have uh, uh, the best out outcome of these uh, uh, elections and we can have a, a constructive uh, European Parliament. But, uh, but I have, a, you know, a positive uh, instinct on what is going to happen in Europe in the coming years. I think that uh, we have learned a lot from the crisis that we suffered over the past four or five years, the pandemic, but not only the pandemic, also the war in Ukraine. 
and, uh, and what we are going to witness is a more federal European Union and a more integrated European Union. I'm really happy to see that you know, we are opening ourselves to Western Balkans, which is a region that we you know, are very committed. You, you see President Virchis is listening He's a good friend. Carefully. He's a good friend of, of Spain and myself. So, you know, happy to, to see him again here with me and, uh, and of course, with Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. How, how, how historic was uh, the agreement on the accession of Ukraine and Moldova? I think it was, I mean, you know. Negotiations, we, accession we, we negotiations. Have, we have, we have uh, you know, we, I, I come from a country, uh, thanks to the leadership of Jacques Delors, uh, Spain and Portugal, we uh, enter uh, the European Union back in uh, the 80s of last century. So, you know, we, we're very happy and very grateful to have been the presidency of the European Council in this very historical moment of the European Union project. So, uh, and I think it was a very important political message, the one that we sent to the Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian uh, government. And uh, let's hope that in the coming months we can end this war and respect the territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine and we can, uh, you know, build uh, peace in the Middle East and the eastern side of Europe. And the West Balkans are the next EU members? Well, I, I mean, uh, that's, that's for sure, you know, we, we are very, very committed and very vocal, you know, Alexander knows, uh, on uh, his accession to the European Union. I think that uh, that will bring us uh, a lot of strength and we will provide uh, the stability that the, that part of, of, of the European Union or, the, or Europe needs. Muchas gracias. Thanks. So gracias. great to see you here again. And, uh, we are now moving from uh, Prime Minister Sanchez and, and Spain to your friend, uh, President Macron of France. Good friend. Good friend. It's a good segue. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.